Well, good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible, and you can join me in John chapter 21. It's uh, good to see you here this morning, and I really do mean that. I've been out for the past uh, several weeks, and so I've missed you. And so it's good to be back here worshiping with you. And uh, I was at kids camp three, three weeks ago. And then um, I followed up kids camp with going on a mission trip to Boston. And uh, and so we meet a couple of us, uh, actually there are about 15 of us that traveled up to Boston and we worked with two specific churches there and we uh, slept on air mattresses throughout the week and uh, the guys took outdoor showers. And uh, and so I felt every bit of 51. I, I know when you look at me, you're thinking, Andy, come on, 51, you, you get no older than, than 50 at least, but no, I'm 51. And, uh, and so I fed every, every one of those years last week. And then we followed up Boston just with a few days away as a family went up to Maine. And so after sleeping on, a, on an air mattress and outdoor showers and doing two basketball clinics a day, we decided to follow up with some hiking up mountains. And, uh, and so physically, I was glad to be back home and to sit at my desk and do a little work. And also just mentally and emotionally, relationally, it's so good to, to see you and to be back in this fellowship and worshiping with you. And uh, just to be reminded this morning uh, of the mercy and the grace of God, isn't it incredible? Uh, I'm, I'm such a sinner, and yet he receives me. Uh, he, he doesn't break the, 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 the broken re- or the, the, the fragile reed. He welcomes you in and, um, and offers you mercy and grace. And uh, it was just so good to be reminded of that today. And in much, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, we've been looking at questions for humans, questions in the Bible that God asks people. Often we think about questions we want to ask God one day when we, um, if you're a believer, when you get to heaven. But maybe more important than those questions are the ones that he has or he asks us. And I'm thankful for the men who've been uh, speaking in my absence over the past several weeks. And uh, this morning, we're going to finish up this series with our final question here in John chapter 21. Uh, Many of you are probably familiar with the name of Chuck Colson. Uh, Chuck Colson is a prolific writer. He's uh, passed away at this point. Um, But prolific writer uh, has impacted people all over the world for the gospel. Uh, But you may not know where his story began. Um, Chuck Chuck Colson began as one of the most powerful, successful men in the world almost overnight. Uh, After growing up in Boston, uh, he received a scholarship to a prestigious Brown University. And from there, he um, got his law degree from George Washington University. He served in the Marines uh, and was uh, one of the youngest captains at that time, um, to be ma- youngest soldiers to be made captains at that time. Uh, after the Marines, he began a political career in 1956 when he was the youngest administrative assistant in the Senate, and he was working for the senator from Massachusetts. And eventually, he worked his way up to assist uh, uh, the, um, actually, President Nixon. He was President Nixon's right-hand man, and all the way up until the Watergate scandal. And in 1974, Chuck Colson, this man who was on top of the world in so many ways, entered a plea of guilty to the Watergate-related charges. And although he was not implicated in the Watergate scandal or the burglary, he voluntarily pleaded guilty to an obstruction of justice. And he entered Maxwell Federal Prison uh, in Alabama in 1974, and he served seven months of a one to three year long uh, sentence. And upon leaving the federal prison, um, Colson was changed. Right before he went to prison, he wasn't a believer at the time, uh, but right before he went to prison, he uh, had a conversation with a young man who gave him the book, Mere Christianity, and he read through the book and sat there in his car. His story, uh, you can read about it in his book called Born Again, but he sits there in his car and he's broken and weeping for an hour that eventually he just says these words, I surrender. And so although a criminal, he goes to prison born again. And his life had been changed. And even after he left prison, he founded a a ministry called a prison fellowship. And this would become uh, perhaps the greatest contribution to the church and the world that Chuck Colson would make. 
He traveled all over the world visiting prisons. He visited some 600 prisons in the U.S. and 40 in other countries. And he built a movement that at one time extended to more than 50,000 prison ministry volunteers. And although um, there are many different prison ministries, jail ministries happening today, many of them, the groundwork was laid by Chuck Colson. And once again, just a stark defender of the faith. Many of you have uh, been influenced by his books and his teachings, whether you realize it or not. And here's the question, you know, how, what was the secret to Chuck Colson's success? How was this man able to, able to make this kind of impact? And I believe if he were standing here today, he would tell you he was able to make this kind of impact through his failure. It was through his failure that he was able to do all the things, to change the world in the way that God had him, uh, God would use him to change it. You know, one thing I, I think we all have in common, uh, you know, there's many different things that divide us and, and, and that are different about each one of us, but one thing that we all have in common in this room is that in some way or another, both in small ways and, and perhaps even big ways, every one of us has failed. We failed either family, um, spouses, our kids, or siblings. We failed friends. We've failed uh, at times those that we work with. And ultimately, every one of us has uh, failed God in some way. We've done things that we, we've said we would never do. We've neglected to do things that we should have done. We've made commitments that we've broken. All of us can look back in our life and, or even maybe just we're in the middle of it now, we failed. We've experienced failure. And as we're going to look at this morning in, in the Bible in John chapter 21 is we're going to look at a man who had perhaps one of the biggest fails of, of all time, a man by the name of, of Peter. Perhaps none of Jesus' disciples failed him more so than Peter. Uh, if you've grown up in church, you're familiar with Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples. He was a fisherman. He was a, a natural-born leader. He was outspoken. Peter was the kind of guy who, if he was in, he was, he was all in. If Peter were at your house and going to uh, enter into the pool, he wouldn't stick his toe in. Peter would, would do the cannonball, right, and get everybody wet, wet and then jump up and laugh at everybody when he, when he got out. I mean, that was Peter, boisterous kind of it made his presence known. He, he usually spoke, and often he would speak without thinking first. Peter had all kinds of unique opportunities with Jesus. He saw him transformed in the mountain of transfiguration. He was there in the garden when Jesus was praying and even sweating drops of blood. And yet for Peter and all his leader and uh, leader capabilities, uh, he had some issues. And one was that he never could seem to wrap his mind around J Jesus and his agenda. He never could seem to grasp the idea that Jesus came to die. Jesus came to be crucified. He had a hard time accepting this reality for Jesus, and he also had this hard, hard time accepting this reality for himself as one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, in Mark chapter 14, Jesus, this is uh, before Jesus is arrested, before he goes to the cross, Jesus pulls his disciples together and he says, you know, every one of you, all right, you're going you're gonna to fall away. And then ultimately he tells Peter that he's going to deny him three times. And Peter's response is, even if everyone runs away, Jesus, I'll stand by you. Peter was extremely confident in himself. He always seemed to believe his loyalty and his love for Jesus was greater than the other disciples until it was shown it wasn't. And that was the night Jesus was arrested. You can read about it a few chapters earlier in John chapter 18. The night that Jesus is arrested, Peter disowns. He denies Jesus, not just once, not twice, but three times. Three times Jesus denies, or Peter denies Jesus. And then on that third time, 
Jesus' eyes look and they lock into Peter's and the rooster crows. And then Peter is a broken man. He's a shattered man. He, uh, all the, the self-confidence and self-assurance that he had is, is, is gone. And he weeps bitterly. Peter had denied Jesus. He, he failed Jesus. And perhaps his greatest moment of need, Peter wasn't there. And just imagine Peter in this moment, the way he's feeling. And he's... Abandoned Jesus, Jesus is now crucified on a cross, Jesus is buried in the grave, and imagine the shame and the embarrassment, the feeling of letting the person who meant the most to you down. What do you, what do, you do in that moment? What's the, what's the right play there when you've failed so miserably and you've hurt the people you're supposed to love the most. What do you do in that moment, in that moment of failure? And, and once again, some, some moments, uh, some failures are, are big, right? Other failures seem small. They seem more personal, right? They don't seem to affect other people, although I believe every failure uh, that we commit, every, every sin of every offense we commit, it, it has implications for other people. But what do you do in those moments? Uh, some people... When they fail, their, their failure becomes their defining mark. It becomes the way they think of themselves. Often they use their failures even as an excuse to live and, and fail more, even to live in failure, to live in disobedience. Some people wreck themselves and they, and they never recover. They can't get over the fact that they would have done something like, and you can fill in the blank. And maybe it's no big thing. Maybe it's just you've done this same thing. Maybe it's just small sin. You stumbled over and over and over and over again, and you feel trapped in your failure. And, and it's hijacked even the rest of your life. I think often in our failure, we're exposed as people who have put too much faith in ourselves and way too little in Jesus. And I think that's what's underlying Peter's failure here. So how does Jesus, how does God, how does Jesus respond when we fail? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning in John chapter 21. How does Jesus respond to you and to me in our failure? Let's read these verses starting in verse 2 of chapter 21. It says, Simon Peter, Thomas... Nathanael and from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. Well, we're coming with you, they told him. And they went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. And when daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer, garment cloth, or outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off, and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. And when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal file that fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there was many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. How does Jesus respond when we fail? When we do that thing, we, we said we'd never do. When we do it again and again. How does Jesus respond? 
Well, first I would like to point out here this morning that Jesus came to the disciples when they were in their failure. And I would say the same thing is true for us. Jesus comes to us in our failures. Imagine Peter on this boat thinking it all over, thinking it's all over, right? At this point, the, uh, the rest of his life would have been defined by this, this denial of Jesus. That's what he was known for. And so here he is on this boat. He's unsure of himself. He's unsure of how Jesus feels about him. At this point, they know Jesus is alive. They, they've seen Jesus, but they haven't had any real personal, right, any, it, this, much conversation. It's been, he's been a little mysterious. He's come and gone. And so Peter here is unsure of himself about how Jesus felt about him. And yet just 100 yards while they're fishing, just 100 yards from them on the shore is Jesus. Now think about this. Out of all the places Jesus could have been in the entire world, in the universe, Jesus is here on the shore and he's pursuing the very ones who had denied him, abandoned him. Jesus, at this point in time, he could, have, he could have gotten anybody on his team that he wanted. I mean, he could have called a whole new squad, could have sent them home and, and redrafted some, some big-time players here. I mean, if you, if, you, uh, ra- if, you're, if you raise from the dead, that comes from a lot of credentials, right? That comes from a lot of influence. You, you have some sway here. But yet here we see Jesus pursuing the same ones that had failed him. Here he is. He could have had anybody on his team he wanted, and yet he's chasing after them. I mean, what grace. What grace we see here in, in Jesus as he pursues those who had failed him so miserably. And then he calls out to them in verse 5. He says, men, you don't have any fish, do you? I, I like that because I feel like Jesus is messing with them a little bit. He, got any, he knows they don't have any fish. How, how many fish do you have out there, guys? None. They don't have any. And what is, what is he doing here? Well, I think Jesus is recreating a scene from the past In fact, in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus first calls these same disciples to follow him, they're in the same situation. They're out fishing in a boat, and Jesus points out, right, he uh, points out they don't have any fish. And then he tells them to put the net on the other side of the boat, and remember what happens. There are so many fish that the boats begin to sink. And then after that, Peter runs up to Jesus. He falls at his knees, and he says, go away from me. Because I am a sinful man. My friends, that's exactly what Jesus is leading Peter here in this moment. The catch of fish. Once again, they're astonished by the number of fish in the boat. And Jesus calls, is going to call out to Peter again, follow me. So Jesus comes to us. In our failure, my friends, and it's all by grace. We, in, our, in our sin, when we run from Jesus, when we feel like we're not worthy of Jesus, it's, it's true. We're not, but yet in the mercy and grace of God, Jesus comes and he, and he pursues us. And look at what Jesus, look what his hope is here. Jesus seeks to restore them. He doesn't just pursue them and come after them. Jesus is purpose is to restore them. And in the same way for us, Jesus, when we fail, he seeks to restore us by his grace. The same grace that first brought Peter to Jesus is the same grace that's still bringing Jesus to Peter and going to bring Peter to Jesus. And this grace that saves is the same grace that sustains us, the same grace that sanctifies us. And we need to remember this in our, in our failures. We need to remember to not just share the gospel with others. The gospel is not just for other people. The gospel is for you and for me, even in, especially in the moments of our failures, the moments of our, of our sin. We must, uh, 
Martin Lloyd-Jones had preached the gospel to ourselves. Too often in our failure, our response is to want to do something, to, to make up for it. Have you ever been there? You've, you've blown it. You did something you shouldn't have done, and so you just kind of want to push back from, from Jesus until you can finally do something that maybe that might earn you some type of forgiveness. Or we want to wait until we get into a certain feel a certain way. I, I, can't, I can't think about my relationship with God. Look at all these things I've done, and, and we wait for some type of feeling to get right with Jesus. Yet Jesus here, it's clear he needs nothing from these disciples. In fact, he's got everything they need. I mean, I love what happens here. Uh, Peter plunges. That word there means he, he violently throws himself overboard into the water. Uh, they'd been fishing. He'd gotten hot. He'd taken some of his clothes off. And so he, he puts back on his outer garment, right? He's going to Jesus. He wants to be respectful of Jesus. So he puts back on this outer garment. He plunges into the water a hundred yards out. Now, listen, I mean, Peter's probably in decent shape here, but a hundred yards in the sea is still a hundred yards, right? That's, uh, I just imagine he just gets so excited. This is a picture of what someone who's hopeful of some type of restoration looks like. I mean, he just uh, abandons common sense and jumps in the water and starts swimming. I could just imagine the, the other disciples in the boat just kind of slowly passing him up, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, they get to the shore before he does. He finally gets there. This is the hope of restoration, my friends. It's, it's us before Jesus, the one who has everything we need. Peter gets there. Jesus doesn't immediately rebuke him or, or ask him a question. Like I, I ask my kids often when they do something that just doesn't seem to make sense, I'll say, what were you thinking? Those words don't come out of Jesus' mouth. Instead, he asks Peter a question. A question that will not only confront his past, but will also shape his future. And he asked it three times. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, Peter, do you love me? And I think there are three different aspects of this, of this question that's important for us to, to take hold of when we think about how Jesus comes to us and restores us in the midst of our failure. First of all, there's, uh, this question is a relational question. Jesus speaks to Peter in the context of relationship. Uh, with Jesus, relationship is priority. And so he asked Peter this because he knows the, the bottom line question, right, in every relationship like this is, do you, is, is about love, right? Like in your families, it's why we're committed to our families and we serve our families. Why do you serve your spouse? It's because you love them. Why do you constantly sacrifice for your children? Well, it's because you love them, right? That's the kind of relationship Jesus has with his disciples. That's the kind of relationship Jesus wants with you. It's not a performance-based relationship. You won't hear this from your boss at work. If your boss at work wants you to do something, he won't follow it up by saying, well, do you love me? That'd be kind of awkward, wouldn't it? Or, I mean, even if you're at a restaurant this afternoon for lunch and, you know, you ask the waitress to get you a refill, you're not going to say, well, do you love me and hold your cup up? That's just, that's just not the way that we handle those kinds of relationships. Why? Because those kinds of relationships are transactional. They're, I'll do this for you, and then you'll do this for me. 
Not so with Jesus. The bottom line of his relationship is love. And so when they get to the shore, Jesus already has the fire going. He already has the the fish and the bread. He doesn't eat anything from them. And he tells Peter to bring the fish that he caught, but but who did that? That was Jesus too, right? (laughs) So there's nothing Peter has to bring Jesus has done it all. In fact, in the Gospels, the disciples never catch fish apart from Jesus. <laughs> they're, they're professional fishermen, but, but not once do we see them actually catching fish outside of the presence of Jesus. But with Jesus, they catch more fish than they can even handle. So even the fish they bring is provided by Jesus. They have nothing. Peter has nothing to offer Jesus here in this moment except His failure. And yet Jesus does not instantly rebuke them, Peter or them, or call them worthless. He he doesn't make them squirm or jump through certain hoops. Jesus looks at them as as they pull up on the shore. And he says, come and have breakfast. You come. Sit down. Let's, let's, Let's talk. You stop talking for me because I don't know about you, but when I sin, I start talking for Jesus. I start putting what I think, right, my words, how I think he should respond to me in his mouth. And I start listening as if he's saying these things to me. And really, it's just me talking for him. And here Jesus is saying, hey, come have, come have breakfast. Just, just sit down and eat some fish and bread. Just breathe for a minute. Listen. With Jesus, it's about relationship. It's a question of, uh, that, that goes to the heart here, that uh, do you love me? And Peter's past actions and moments were not as important to Jesus here. Here, Jesus wants to know the condition of Peter's heart. Now, this doesn't mean Jesus simply forgets what Peter's done or that he ignores, right? I mean, there's this big elephant in the room. So this question that that Peter asked Jesus, it's a relational one, but it's also a confrontational question. With this question, do you love me? Jesus is going to confront Peter. Uh, notice what Jesus does here. He, this is all intentionally. He, uh, the, they pull up on the shore, and what, what is Jesus doing? He has this, uh, John tells us, he's very specific, that J- Jesus has built this, set up this fire, this charcoal fire. And you know, the only other place in the New Testament where we see this word for charcoal is in John chapter 18, verses 17 and 18. And do you know when that other charcoal fire fire takes place? It's when Peter denies Jesus. And so Jesus is kind of recreating the scene. Are you following it? He's taking Peter back to the moment, this this flashback when, when Peter denied Jesus. And then notice also the question that Jesus asked in verse 15, do you love me? And the first time Jesus asked it, he says, do you love me more than these? Now, there's been a lot of talk about what what Jesus is asking there. What does Jesus mean when he says, do you love me more than these? Well, once again, there's all kinds of opinions, and it's okay to, uh, Scripture is not abundantly clear here. But I think that Jesus is talking about the other disciples. When he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? I think he's saying, Uh, Peter is there and they've kind of finished the breakfast and the other disciples are doing their thing. And Jesus has this moment, this one-on-one moment with Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, why would would Jesus put that question to Peter? Is he wanting Peter to say, well, yeah, I I love you more than anybody. Well, no, he's, he's reminding Peter that was exactly what he said. Before, Peter said, even if everyone falls away, Jesus, not me. (laughs) <laughs> not me, these guys, yeah, I mean, look at them, right? But not this guy, Jesus. I'm, I'm with you, Jesus. 
And so he's reminding Peter of his boast with this question. And then finally, we see with this question, he asks it not just once, not just twice, but three times. Why would Jesus ask this question three times? Because Peter had denied Jesus three times. So Jesus is not just, not just overlooking Peter's failure here. But he's reminding of him of it by recreating this scene. And, and, and why does he do this? I mean, is, is Jesus trying to shame Peter? I mean, uh, trying to embarrass him? Well, no, I think he's trying to confront Peter in the same way that you go to a doctor and they confront your sickness. And before you can be healed and remedied of it. You have to see the seriousness of it. You have to see it at its core. And so here Jesus is reminding Peter that Peter, right, he had all along been asserting his, his loyalty, his love for Jesus. All along this, this Peter, right, he was so self-assured, so confident in himself, even to the point that he rebuked Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus says he's going to go to Jerusalem and be, be handed over to the, to the religious leaders and going to be persecuted and ultimately put to death. And, and Peter comes up to him and says, not you, Jesus. And then again, later on, he, he says, all you're going to fall away from me, right? And then Peter once again says, not me, these other guys, but not me. So Peter is so sure of himself that he even calls out Jesus. So Jesus is leading Peter here to see that at one, at one point he was relying on his own strength, right? All this faith was in himself. And the faith he had in himself has failed him. In fact, do you remember what Jesus tells Peter to pray for? When he's warning him that he's going to deny him, he says, pray that your faith will not fail. And my friends, Peter's faith failed because it, it wasn't because Jesus failed. Because it, was, it wasn't because his faith wasn't strong enough. It was because his faith was in the wrong place. His faith was in himself. And this is the root of Peter's sin, and it's the root of our failure, our sin. And so Jesus is leading Peter to see that to a place where he will come to rely on and put his faith in the one who loves him and will never fail him. And that's Jesus. I love how Peter responds that third time. It's almost as if he finally gets it, right? He, he says, Jesus, I, uh, I love you. And then Jesus asks him again, uh, do you love me? And Peter responds, yes, I love you. And then the third time, Jesus asks him again. And then the third time, Peter answers. Notice how he answers differently. Jesus, you know all things. Even Peter's assurance of his love for Jesus doesn't rest in the confidence he has in himself, but it rests in the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus, you know. And here, Peter is at the end of himself. There is only one boast to be made here for Peter, and it is in Jesus and in Jesus' love for him. And this is the same love that it stooped to, to wash Peter's feet in John chapter 13. It's the same uh, love that sweat drops of blood in the garden, the same love that stretched out and was nailed to a cross. This is the love that chased Peter from Jerusalem to Galilee. And in the moment when Peter thought it was all over, Jesus is now loving him and embracing him again. This is where this confrontation is going for help, to help Peter see that his confidence cannot be in himself. 
His faith must be in Jesus. Self-assured Peter no longer exists. Jesus assured, overwhelmed by the love of Jesus, Peter is now the one who will march forward in the book of Acts. And Acts chapter 2 is is standing before thousands of people preaching the gospel. This is the Peter. And oh, what, what relief that should bring for you and I. When we look at ourselves and our failure, we don't think we're good enough. My friends, it's never about how good we are. It's about the mercy and the grace and the love of Jesus that has grabbed a hold of us. And our faith in him. So here we have a confrontational question. And finally, this question, do you love me? It is a reformational question. I think that's a word. I don't really know. Just go with it, will you? It felt right, reformational. You know what I mean, right? This question is going to reform him. It's going to change him. It's going to redirect him. Jesus is going to use this question to help Peter see what love looks like. He says, feed my lambs. Then he responds again, well, then if you love me, shepherd my sheep. If you love me, Peter, feed my sheep. Jesus is tying Peter's love for him with caring for his people. You see, before Peter had expressed his love for Jesus through standing up for Jesus, Peter said, I'm going to grab my sword. I'm going, to, I'm going to fight for you, Jesus. But here, Jesus reforms Peter's thinking of what it means to love him, to follow him. And he says, Peter, you don't get to lay down your life on your own terms. No, this is how you're going to lay down your life. It's in sacrificial love for a people. It's feed my sheep. So Jesus is connecting this love that Peter is expressing for Jesus. He's connecting it for love and care for others. He says, Peter, your your service to other people will be rooted in your love for me. And love for Jesus is, is the only way that we can truly love others. My friends, if you love Parents, let me just cut to the chase. We're running out of time. If you love your kids more than you love Jesus, then your love for your kids is going to be broken. If you love your spouse, if you love your girlfriend, if you love anyone more than you love Jesus, your love for them will be insufficient. Love for Jesus is the, is the cornerstone, is the shaping reality for us to be able to love other people. And, and we see this is true in, in Peter's life. As you look through, as you look at the, the book of Acts, you'll see Peter standing up amongst the disciples, leading and shepherding the church, bolding, proclaiming the gospel to thousands of Jews, right? Over 3,000 people were saved. And, and how does Peter get there? He's been reformed and been reshaped by the love of Jesus. And now out of of response to that, right, his love for Jesus, he's caring and loving others. And, you know, John is writing this gospel. Why why does he spend so much time talking about Peter? Well, most of the other books of of the Bible have been written or the New Testament have been written at this point. And so John is looking back and he's saying, how does Peter go from the guy who has denied Jesus three times to all of a sudden the leader in in the church, right, that we see in the book of Acts. And so he's writing these words to help us see, right, to, to connect the dots. And how does it happen? Amazingly enough, it happens through Peter's failure. Bold, confident Peter that we see early on in the Gospel of John is not the same guy who's leading the church in the New Testament or the book of Acts. The guy we see there is the broken, shattered, brought to the end of his rope. Peter, who now has an unshakable confidence and faith in the love and the mercy and the grace 
of Jesus. Chuck Colson said this about his failure. He said, the great paradox of my life is that every time I walk into a prison and see the faces of men or women who have been transformed by the power of the living God, I realize that the thing God has chosen to use in my life is none of the successes, achievements, degrees, awards, honors, or cases I won before the Supreme Court. That's not what God's using in my life. What God is using in my life to touch the lives of literally thousands of other people is the fact that I was a convict and went to prison. That was my great defeat, the only thing in my life I didn't succeed in. Oh, that's the the grace of God. And it's for you too. If you're in the middle of your failure, Jesus is coming to you and he desires to restore you. He's asking you this question, do you love me? Step on in here, let's let's have a conversation. Let's talk about the object of your faith. Let's talk about what it looks like to follow me. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? You know what I find so comforting is that even in my worst failures, even in the midst of my sin, my habitual sin, Jesus already knows. And Jesus is not surprised, he's not shocked. And so there's no need for me to try to conceal it, to try to downplay it, for me to try to manage my sin. No, he comes to me and he invites me to confess it. And this morning I... I want you to see the grace of God and the freedom his grace gives you to confess your sin. Would you just do that even here as we said? Would you just, and maybe you can't think of anything in particular. Maybe there's just an apathy you have. When you think about Peter jumping out of that boat, that's the last thing you would have done. And would you just take a minute to confess your sin?